And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Ink and Liar, the creators of the upcoming campaign setting, The Stargazer's Guide to Aurora. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. He will, he will not teach you to dodge, but he is the one, the one and only Mr. Daniel Hodges. How you doing today, man? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. The pronunciation is correct, and uh, yeah, ready to go. Thanks for having me. All right. So, I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. What, um, okay. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, I love talking about that too. So um, I'm a, I'm a, I, I would call myself a late bloomer to the role-playing uh, game industry. So uh, about four years ago, maybe five. I think it is because uh, my my wife she came up to me and she was like, "Hey, you, I've always wanted to try and play D and D, right?" And this was this was five years ago. I never played in high school. I didn't play in college. Um, I didn't play at any time growing up in any way. There were other hobbies and things I was doing. And she came up to me and she was like, "I want to I want to play a game." And she's like, "Let's play. Let's run Curse of Strahd. I've got some people that she knew uh, that she wanted us to um, to play with." And that was my first experience in in D and D was playing was playing Curse Strahd. This was like I said four or five years ago, mm-hmm. and um, I was I was working through I, I was working at Wells Fargo. I was in the bank. I was in the finance world. All that kind of fun stuff. And we it just absolutely like basically took over our lives as we we made our way through Curse Strahd. Um, we ended up. We ended up having one of those moments where a character at our table um, was basically by themselves in the catacombs. Spoiler alert for Curse Strahd, if you've never been there before or it's seen been, it. It's but been this, around it's long been out enough. Long, yeah. It's been around long enough. The statute's passed. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's on you. That's on you if you haven't seen it yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're in the catacombs of, of Ravenloft there, and we had a moment where one of the characters was... Everyone was dead except for that one character... And like the dice rolled like two natural twenties in a row, and they ended up uh, successfully slaying Strahd, and then was able they were able to get a couple of the other characters back up, and we we won we won the whole thing. We're all sitting there with our our closest friends, uh, who are now our closest friends, and the the dice in the game it just made this magical moment for us, and we were basically just hooked after that. Um, I started at, after that campaign was over. Uh, I made my way from the player side to the DM side, and that's when Arroyo was really born. Um, that first campaign about four years ago. Um, it's a homebrew world I made for the, for those guys, and uh, that's how we that's how we got into tabletop RPGs. Well, that an- that answers that answers one of the questions I, I was going to follow up with the origin story of um, of Aurora. Um Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me let me expand on that a little bit, uh, real quick. So, it was after that Curse of Strahd campaign. I was like, all right, I want if I want to be a if I'm going to DM a game, I want to make sure I don't want to really do a module, which we do modules now on our show in Iron Valor. But I, I wanted to I wanted to do my own homebrew world, and so we actually uh, just I, I bought one of those big whiteboard, not whiteboards, but those like tear away like large post-it note things. And stuck one of them on my wall, and we just started drawing it. And like the capital city you see on our Kickstarter is like Cambria, and like that's the first city I drew, and then I drew the rest of the world out along with it. And it was literally just the same people that, or most of the same people that were in the Chris Strahd campaign, joined in with that, and we just started playing. And like I said, this was this was only three or four years ago, and that's how Aurora was born as the first homebrew game that I ever ran. Mm-hmm. And now it's 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 one hell of a leap to go from the <clears throat> gothic horror of Curse of Strahd to mm-hmm. 
to a ver to a ver to a very um a very star a very star in co star in constellation al almost um I'd say I'd say almost fer almost fertile crescent e um aesthetic with Aurora. Um, what were what were some of the things that ser that served as the impetus to put this emphasis on stars and constellations? Yeah, so the stars and constellations. Yeah, there's a massive ju juxtaposition there between uh, what we were dealing with with all the Kerstrat stuff, and then this now. Um, the stars and the zodiac and all of those things. Um, those came later. Um, it was something that we wanted to because Aurora was really inspired um, from from me from all the sources that you know I, I grew up with. Um, obviously, like like everyone, huge Lord of the Rings friend. Uh, fan, um, huge. Uh, I like a lot of the Patrick Rothfuss stuff, um, and and Chronicles of Narnia, all that, all that kind of classic, you know, fantasy stuff. That's where it all came from. But the mechanics and the Zodiac stuff and the stars, that was really something that came along later. Um, we have a couple of people on our Ink and Liar team who are really into astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll tell you that they're not, but they really are. Uh, <laughs> They're like, oh, I don't think it's real, and I don't think it's all this, but they they are, and they they love it, and it's great. And um, the zodiac stuff came later on because we need, and it was something that I don't even think we could have done in the beginning because it's so mechanically heavy, um, and we wanted to do something that was super mechanics based that actually changed the way you were going to approach adventuring in Aurora because we wanted to do something that was similar to, not similar to, but uniquely set apart like Theros mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then the, in that whole Pity system they have over there so we came up with the the zodiac concept because we said all right these two things have a good marriage they fit together like astrology and DD should go together pretty seamlessly and mm -hmm. and we found that they fit really well and so that was something we it was a mechanic that we added to the world because Source magic in Arroyo was already such a big part of the setting that we threw this on top, effectively, to really set it apart from everything else that's out there. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the key one of one of the key things that's brought to bear with 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 Aurora is what you guys are calling the Zodiac character build system. Um, yeah. How how did this kind how did this kind of thing come about? And I'd like you to. Kind of, kind of walk me through how it works compared to um, a more vanilla character creation setup. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me see. How do I how do I start this? Because I don't want it to I don't want it to take up the entire time um, because it's it's so I, it's so unique to the system. So um, the reason we chose the the zodiacs fit well and what we have conceptualized in our mind was this idea of source magic and the idea that magic is unknowable right you have uh that magic magic works wizards figure out how to use it sorcerers can naturally tap into it bards just bring it into existence and we started thinking about the different ways that source magic is created and then we created the system the sign system over the top to kind of make sense of it all, and in, in, in a lot of the same ways that ancient astrologers did too. It's like because astrology can be found all over the world. It's in you know it's in China, it's in Egypt, it's in all the ancient, ancient civilizations because people try to figure out things they can't understand. Mm -hmm. If you can't understand the heavens and the stars, and you could never know, you try to figure out and apply you know this idea to you and so we did the same thing to magic so um we said that there were sources of magic and they were um related to the uh four elements it was um you know uh it was the vibes it is um the like where you would have earth signs you'd have divine signs instead or natural signs and arcane signs and the vibes the charisma all these different spell casting modifiers um, we assigned those to some of the zodiac stuff, and then we said that each of the each characters and people who are in Arroya are also ruled by the schools of magic. And the schools of magic are simply the the ways that humans and humanity could possibly understand 
uh, magic as, it, as a whole. And then we said that there, so you can be ruled by a sign, you have your elements of the sign, which is kind of where the source magic comes from. And then you have these overarching signs as a whole. And so now that, because we de- what we decided was we wanted magic to influence people on an individual level, and we wanted to give people the power and the capacity that if they wanted to use this sign system instead of like racial features, they could do so and they'd have a character that was mechanically about the same. Um, now you now you could always you can always do racial features too, but um, you could use this as a replacement for that, or if you wanted to make sure you didn't didn't have two overpowered characters, um, and then what it, it would what it lets you do is it lets you make a completely unique character every single time, and you have traits and abilities and um, not these in, in fact detriments as well these benefits and detriments that you get with the sign system that are more attached to the school of magic you're associated with and the lore and personality of your character through your sign than it is about who you are, like what race you are or anything like that. Um, so there's there are eight rulership tables, eight, uh, eight, all eight of those have three different tables along with them. Um, just quick math, you know, you've got, it, it's, several like tens of thousands of different character combinations that you could make with the system uh we we want it to be we we suggest that you make it randomized but you can also play it you know go through and pick all your stuff and pick which sign you're going to be pick who your ruler is um and then you get your various benefits on top of that Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah now when it comes Within the, within that within that particular um, that particular setup, is it a, is it a case where there where there's just as much option for people to go fo- go um go pick it go pick and choose as well as go as well as do randomize? Yeah, yeah. Um. So there's a so what what we have is an option and kind of the there there's two different ways you can there there's a couple different ways you can do it, but mm-hmm. we su- we suggest you kind of go through and choose your sign based on the kind of character you want to play. Like, you know, if you want to be a uh, flirt or if you want to be a uh, frost wane, you know, all these different signs that we have that are similar to the Zodiacs. They are, they have certain personality traits and the way you want to play a character. Uh, we suggest you pick that yourself. And then uh, depending on how you, how you interpret the different schools of magic, like evocation or um, abjuration, if you want to add one of a skill of that, mindset to your character you can do that too um the thing that we want people to do randomly is or what i would suggest that people do randomly is after you've selected your sign and your ruler that fits your character concept you get the benefits randomly so like for instance um if you are a let's say you're a flirt uh which is associated with aries um then you're going to get benefits uh and you decide you want to be evocation um evocation is going to be your rulership so you're a flirt evocation character um you can get in you can go into this character sheet and you can look at the benefit table there's eight different options right there i'm just going to pull one of these Mm -hmm. um let's see it says uh it's called everlasting sunset and all it says is you know the light cantrip you can cast it without need for material components when your light cantrip is shiny may you use your action to release a burst of sunlight dispels magical darkness of third level or lower and illuminates invisible creatures within range and that's just that's a feature that your character gets and they have that now it's different it's unique it doesn't matter what your race is doesn't matter what your character build is you just know this because the sign you were born under and the time of day and the rulership that you have allows you to do that and so there are eight different options you can get for that major evocation benefit so even if you played another flirtide evocation character, you would have a different mechanical capacity. Yeah. Now, with it, now given given the fact that the that a lot of these rulers are um are are essentially affiliated with magic in one form or another. Mm-hmm. Um, one que- one question that one question that I do have is are are you go are you going with the idea that ev- that everybody has some intr- 
in this setting has some intrinsic association with magic. Yeah. Even, um, if even if it's more subtle than others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, let, me, let me say that a little further. So you've got um, everyone er who adventures in Aurora, and not just adventurers, but NPCs and characters, everyone who's ever existed in Arroyo has a sign and they have a benefit and they have detriment. So it raises the floor for everyone who exists there. So even commoners would have some small level of potential magic. And but it's not all exclusively like spells and abilities and things that would be mechanically useful in, you know, let's say combat or dungeoneering or anything like that. Like some of them are uh some of the abilities that we have in here are built for martial classes and less martial classes but they're just they're, they're built so that they don't really have magical you know necess necessarily magical inherent abilities like for instance if you um there there's one there's one feature that's just called deny defeat and all it is is when you roll a saving throw against a spell you can do so with advantage once per day and it increases as you get higher in levels um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. One of them, one of them is like you get an extra bonus. You get a plus one to your AC. That's it. You're just harder to hit. You're just inherently tougher as part of the ab ab abjuration tier. Um, and that's something that isn't. It's magical that you get this benefit because that's your sign and that's what you're ruled by as a character. But it's not necessarily like you're not going to see everyone casting spells. Just some people are tougher, some people are better against spells, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, um, the other, qu the other question that I have when it comes to when it comes to this emphasis on on star on stars and constellations is how is how that is how that affects um, pr um, more traditional spellcasters. Um, mm -hmm. Putting putting aside subclasses, we'll get to that in a bit. But just how, but does it but does it affect does it affect the way spellcasting is going to work or is it going to work largely the same as it does in vanilla? For spellcasters themselves, I would say the sign system is a the sign system and the way that we conceptualize signs for Roria you could say that it was designed by wizards and spellcasters. So the idea that it, it doesn't necessarily change the way spellcasters would actually cast spells or anything like that, um, but it sort of more closely explains how they do it. Um, like, so there's a lot of conversation here. We talk about the elements of the weave, uh, how it how it functions, how um, how the different casters can get, um, how the different casters interact with one another. Like we talk about natural magics, divine magics, vibe, arcane, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But as far as the actual mechanics of casting a spell or anything like that, it's not going to change it too much, um, other than to say that certain elements. Um, have a closer relationship, and there's a reason that, like, if your your element of the weave, um, you know, like flirtide is always is always a um, a vibe sign, and it goes well with other arcane signs, and that's charisma, intelligence based casters. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes you may find character giving characters an additional reason to like one another and to adventure together and to find common ground between their signs. Now. Given the given the fact, given the fact that um, when it comes to when it comes to rulership, e each of the rulers is a um, is a is one of the spheres of magic. Mm -hmm. um, one question that one question that I that I certainly have is, would there be would there be a would there be a conflict if someone's if the type of magic that someone can cast is not is not one of their um is one of their is not one of their rulers like let's say somebody is somebody is a full is a elemental focused um druid um and their ruler is necromancy would that create a conflict i think it would um 
because who the way the way we think about astrology is it's not predictive a lot of people do do believe that and they you can go get your horoscope and all that kind of stuff you look at the stars and it can tell you if things are going well or things coming in your future all that kind of stuff most of that is the according to the research that we've done in our subject matter experts most of that's you know it's it's hokum uh doesn't doesn't make any sense there's no way it actually changes your day-to-day experience and we don't believe that the choices you make after you're born should really have any effect on your rulership um now i would say that the system is written in such a way that if you're going to be away four elements monk or if you're going to be a high evocate or if you're going to be an evocation wizard it makes sense that you would also be ruled by evocation and we have designed it with that flexibility to say that oh if if, if it fits your character concept you can pick your rulership to match um but if they if they mismatch i think that makes your character more interesting like i, I would love to i like the idea that you would have like a you might have this frail, average, wizard-looking person who is um, whose focus is divination, right? But then their rulership is abjuration, yep. and so for whatever reason, they're just a little bit tougher than everyone else. And you've got this, uh, you've got this juxtaposition, these um, just these conflicting ideas, and I think that makes your character more interesting and i don't think it i don't think it would have a negative effect on you because i that doesn't i would not rule that way i think many i think if you wanted to play that way you could um and i think you could say oh well you're you're a you know you're a fighter whose deal is necromancy so maybe you um maybe necromatic like things are easier for you to deal with or maybe you had some connection to you know zombies in some way but uh, I think you can make things easier, but I don't think it would make things harder. Um, I think it makes things more interesting, though. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, signs, I know you you hinted at a you hinted at a few of them, and mm-hmm. um, and I I um, obviously um, obviously we can't go into an extreme amount an extreme amount of um of detail with them, but I I do think we can go into a bit of a, a bit of the skinny of them if that if that's cool with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're talking about the individual signs themselves? Yes. Okay. Well, if you go, if you if you go to our Kickstarter, you can see that there. If you if you're out there anywhere, you go check out our Kickstarter. Uh, you can see that there's a um, uh, uh, a sample guide. It's yes. about 67 pages, and we we've, we've listed all of the different signs there. And so um, we made what what we did was we we basically took all the 12 traditional astrological signs and. Uh, we made our way through them. So the first one, uh, they start with Flirt Tide, mm-hmm. which is um, the, it's a, a, akin to Aries. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's these passionate characters. It's a vibe sign. Uh, and traditionally, it's associated with a lawful alignment. Um, you have Wisterus, which is, which is Taurus. And it just goes, goes around the whole list. But every single one has uh, traits and abilities and personality things that match up with the various characters. And I think... One of the cool things is about it is you can say it's it's great for making NPCs and things like that and and creating characters because you can say oh I'm going to be Sunbask that's a Gemini character this character is going to be curious creative and sometimes disingenuous um, this character is probably also going to be chaotic and I learn a lot about the character just by their sign um, and then uh, you have Oris which is Cancer. Uh, they're very similar in that way, um, and each of each of the signs has their own. What, what's the best way to say it? they? They're called manifestations. So some of the signs, as you go around the wheel and over there, um, they have these different ways that the signs themselves impact humanity and how they appear in Aurora. Like for instance, there's this thing called Perium, which is with Leo, um, that is the uh, the firelight assembly. And and basically what it works, and this is this is this is all new content. We're dropping it here first. Um, have not released this to the general public. But with the Firelight Assembly, basically what it is is it's, it's a it's this idea that these small little 
almost whimsical like fairies could appear at places where performances are being held it is the personification of it's the personification of the idea of captivating an audience storytelling so it, if you are a perium character or if you are not even if you not even necessarily probably happens more often for you as a perium um but if you are telling a story if you're giving an audience if, and or 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 playing to an audience something like that you can read the room better and you might see these little small flex basically like pixie fairy like things that appear and entrance your audience and enhance your performance and it is something that could appear on the material plane and it just it changes everything about it and brings everybody into this whole new experience something that couldn't happen it's just where magic itself is called upon and appears at your at your side and it's just and there, there's something like that for all of them and as, as you go all the way around the wheel yeah now um now my my bir my birth sign is um leo and so and the and um i'd be i'd be here and i will admit i'm a bit curious how that particular um that particular constellation is represented here yeah so Le leo's the perium um, so for us, we decided Le Leo works as, um, it's a neutral sign. Mm -hmm. It's also a vibe. So we thought about, cause Leo was the lion one and we decided the manifestation was the firelight assembly, um, over there, but we, we didn't want to go with just the roaring lion, which everybody, um, Go, goes with me. and just because it didn't didn't really make sense uh, we couldn't find a a good way to have that manifest so we went with the the sheer force of personality um that was uh that was leo to to make that work so for us uh leo is associated with perium uh they are egotistical uh <laughs> generous uh no sorry they are egotistical they are generous and charismatic. Their manifestation is the firelight assembly that we just talked about. They are vibe sign and they are neutral alignment. Um, and they they're one of the more we we call them the sexy signs, if that makes sense. It's like it's like uh, it's it's Perium, it's Wisterus, uh, and then I think it's the the Scorpio, the the the, the, the which is um. Which is dusk worn. Those are the those are the sexy signs, and we expect them to be associated with a lot of bards, <laughs> a lot of bards, a lot of um, sorcerers, and that sort of thing. A lot of bards before or after they die? True. Probably after. I don't know. Oh, not sure. I'm just, I'm just, say, I'm just saying. Don't um, don't send the bard out to slay the dragon. Yeah, yeah, probably not. I'm just, we're thinking like Valor Bards, you know. It's like get out here and inspire everyone. Um, that 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 Valor Bard, about the College of Swords, um, even Eloquence, um, I, I think as well. And it works. It's it's a, it's a super Bard heavy sign, and I expect a lot of the Leos to to fall in that class. Mm -hmm. Um. Now speaking of, speaking of speaking of class, um, mm -hmm. you're adding um, you're adding three races and twelve and twelve subclasses. Um, That's correct. Now when it comes when it comes to the when it, now before we, before we get into the races that you're adding, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a question that I often ask people who are, who have their own um, campaign setting. Are there are there any are there any races or any or any classes that you that you would say might be harder to fit, might be harder to fit into Aurora or is it a case where everything's on the table? Um, I play I play my games where I when when I DM when I play games I always choose to say. That if you want to make your character and be a specific race, we'll make it work. Um, even if we have to, that's the way I do it. Um, I think that in Aurora, so for me personally, I think you can play any race in any campaign. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the kind of just personal thing that 
that I feel as a as a as a creator and as a as a DM. Um, now that being said, I do think specifically in Aurora that the only things it, it is a large world with a vast set of peoples and races and all that sort of thing. It's a very um, there there's somewhere for basically everyone. Um, the only races that I would you know, kind of think about and maybe try to justify or would need to on an individual campaign by campaign basis to make an excuse for or to figure something out would be all the races that are, you know, inherently a part of other settings. So like it'd be it'd be a little weird to have a war forge in Aurora. Not saying that you couldn't do it, not saying that you couldn't make it work. I'm not saying you couldn't say they're from across the sea or something like that, but that race is so entombed with Eberron that it'd be hard to do. Um, same thing with like Leonin from Theros. Mm. It's so specific to Theros that it'd be hard. It'd be hard to do. Um, would, you say, would you say any of the core races would be would be trickier, or, would, or do you think those, or do you think those would still be relatively doable? Oh yeah, I think all the core races have a, have a place for them. Mm. Um, every single one even even a lot of the monstrous races so we 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 there are very specific you know dwarven elven human dragonborn cities all throughout the continent and there are, there's a very specific like tiefling oriented um city called the crossing that has a dedicated or the people who in, are in charge there are tiefling um there's a place for all your halflings and all your gnomes um, but very specifically, there's this area of the there's this mountain range. This is a very you know druid heavy, very natural magic heavy, where many of the um, monstrous races choose to be from, or that they choose to live, just because there's so much um, there's so many natural resources and places that they feel very very comfortable. So like um, plenty of space for all your tabaxi and um, the uh, Arakakra and Janazi's Goliaths. There's places for them all along that mountain range where, you know, like even centaurs and stuff, that they have space and room to be who they are and to have those kinds of races be fit in the world, no problem. Yeah. Um, now, when it com now, when it comes to subclasses, I, mm -hmm. I, will, I, I will get the bad joke out of my system first. Okay. Um, was the reason you went with twelve subclasses was to ha to have um, one subclass per zodiac sign, or is that coincidence? It was it was one subclass per zodiac sign, and then uh, it there, there there was the rule of twelve. There's mm -hmm. it, it's one subclass per zodiac sign, and then it's one subclass per um, D and D class, um, which we, which we figured out in all of our stuff that we're gonna have to put the artificer on on DM's guild, so it actually. We we made something called the Lapidary Artificer, um, and so it's actually gonna have to go on D DM's Guild because of SRD stuff. Um, but you can see it on there, and um, but yeah, it was the twelve signs, twelve classes, you know, twelve subclasses. And now, give, now given that, I'd like to um, I'd like to go I'd like to go through the ba the base classes, and. Um, yeah. And and kind of get a feel for what for what you're gonna be for what you're gonna be adding to, to them. What how how you're gonna be messing with their sandbox with the subclasses that you've you've got in mind. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'll I'll start at the t I'll start at the top. Consider this kind of our lightning round. Um. Barbarian. Barbarian. Oh, okay. So you wanna you wanna talk about the stuff that we haven't we haven't released yet? Hold on. Let me go. I, I might not have that readily available. I've got the three that I've. Let me see if I can find it. I didn't have that pulled up. Okay. Um. Do to do. Sorry about this. No worries. Um, this is our own little bed. This is our own little bed of chaos here in the monastery. Mm, uh, I'm, I'm. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it now. Um, okay. So the barbarian, uh, it is a, it's called the barbarian iron claw, and so what it is is it is a, uh, it's a barbarian that is a part of this um, tribe essentially of iron claw, um, basically kind of almost not werewolf like but similar. 
um, probably closer to knoll like than anything else. And they're uh, this whole traveling nomadic kind of people groups uh, that live out there. Mm-hmm. The Iron Claw, yeah. yeah. Bard. Bard is the uh, it is the College of Gospel. It's kind of a cleric sort of based class mm-hmm. um, that is uh, super duper fun, radiant magics, extra healing, um, all kinds of fun stuff. Super duper cool. Love it. Um, I will refrain from making a Blues Brothers joke. No, you can do it. That's great. <laughs> just, <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> I'm just saying, am I, is is the bard going to be glowing blue and saying, I have seen the light? Hey, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I'm here for it. Yep. If that's what you want to do with it. But so, d- kind of a, just a divine, divinely flavored uh, college of gospel bard. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Well, speaking of that, cleric. Cleric is the... Uh, s- it is the planar domain. This is one I don't want to talk about it too much because it's very, um, it's very specific to this because there's there's this astrological plane that's associated with where all these signs kind of exist and it it's layered on top of you know the ethereal and the material and this this planar but this planar domain ha- is it's it's a cleric to the signs effectively as if they were gods they're not really gods but it's it's a cool sign it's it's a cool little yeah when, planar domain. You mentioned when you mentioned planar i immediately thought okay dimensional fuckery yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um druid or depending on, or depending on your taste in adventure games druid druid uh no druid i always say druid um i, just, I, I had to get i, I had to get a mystery of the druids joke in there <laughs> uh the druid is the circle of micrology um so it's this it's this concept that the 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 druid it's al- almost like circled the land right and circled the arctic or whatever but it's the circle of micrology it's to all these small individual um single-celled and bacteria-like organisms that make up the vast majority of many ecosystems um mm-hmm. that are kind of the lifeblood of all that and it's this idea that it's the itty bitty little pieces that you need. It's kind of a lot of lot of bacteria, a lot of like large pieces. It's or a lot of small things that make up a whole bug yeah. swarms, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, probably probably Nicholas Cage's worst nightmare. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> um, for sure. Fighter. Fighter is one that. Uh, well, I have commission out, so I don't have an answer for you on that one yet. The writer's still getting back to me. All, all right. Um, Monk. Monk is uh, based out of... There's a city uh, in the... <clears throat> there's a city called New Reach in Arroyo North, uh, which is a uh, dragonborn, uh, metallic dragonborn kind of vibe to it. Mm. Um, the There's a monastery there. Uh, the monastery of New Reach, the monks that are in this book will be coming from there. Uh, one of the primary things that that monastery does, it is a protective force that um, watches over a portal to the abyss called Death's Door. Mm-hmm. And so they are extremely high-powered fighters that are these dragonborn monks. They're super cool. Yeah, um, Paladin. Paladin is the Oath of Sovereignty. Uh, pa- o- oath of Sovereignty, it is a type of, is an oath to saying that my my will is my will and your will is your will and I will do everything that I can to keep my own, um, I guess, uh, autonomy and also do what I can to make sure you keep yours. Mm-hmm. It is It is the epitome of uh, <laughs> it's the epitome of a, um, li- is it libertarian? I was going to, I was going to say a radical centrist. Yeah. yeah me, I think so. That, that checks out. It's whatever Ron Swanson is, um, <laughs> Ron, from Swanson, Ron Swanson is, br- is mother nature's brother, brother nature, brother nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's it. He's, um, that, that's what it is, but it is. It is ex- it's ensuring autonomy for 
uh, yourself and everyone else around you and that others get to have a say in their lives. Yeah. Um, Ranger, the um, the most snake-bitten class of 5th edition. Yeah, so I want... To, can, can, can I talk for a second about Rangers? Because it's in the... Uh, okay, right so... Down. Okay, so Rangers suck. And so... <laughs> And every, everybody knows it. So one of, we created something called the Marshall Ranger. And you can go, and so it's in the promotional as well. Um, you can go find it there. But the what we did with the Marshall Ranger was we created something that every good Ranger class needs and every good character needs, which is the larger overarching organization that helps them out. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, for the Marshall Ranger, there are three different organizations you can be a part of, all of which are in, in Arroyo. It's the Sparrowhawks, the, Spe- the Peacekeepers, and the Sanctuary. Um, the Sparrowhawks are kind of this, like, almost, like, MI6, like, CIA kind of spy organization. Uh, they are a big part. They're... They're a big part of Lacambria and Aurora as a whole. Uh, they're they're everywhere, and they have all these little hideouts that you can go into, and that you get certain benefits for would being be, a part of their organization. Would yeah. they be not too dissimilar to the Harpers in um, Forgotten Realms? I'm not real familiar with that. Not real familiar with that. I haven't spent a lot of time in the Forgotten Realms. Oh, it's a it's a long story, but they. Te- but they but they do t- they do tend to be the information organization especially in some of the lar- especially in some of the larger cities in fi- in Faerun. um the the other jo- the other joke i was going to i was going to make is that if you got a message from the sparrowhawks it might ha- it might have something at the bottom saying this scroll will self destruct in 5 seconds good luck <laughs> that would be that would be super fun i don't think i don't think necessarily does that per se but um they they are uh, it, it would. I would say it's probably not dissimilar to that, um, but it is. It, it is. They're they're inherently woven into the, the Arroyo at large. Um, the peacekeepers are very much like what you would think of, like Wyatt Earp, the cowboy on the on the range. They have. Mm-hmm. Um, they you can deputize individuals and in cities, and uh, there's a mechanical way for you to recruit people and NPCs to go along with the party or to complete certain tasks for you. Um, and then the Scarlet Sanctuary, which is, um, I guess, most similar to like the Cobalt Soul monk, um, because it's this idea that there is a, there's a library that has all the known knowledge um, in the, uh, of your continent um, is available to you and you have access to it. You can get information from the Scarlet Sanctuary. You can only have like, a certain number of requests in at a time uh, and there are other sanctuaries and other continents that you could get access to you know but you have to earn your way in that sort of thing um but super cool it's got this context confidants f- feature which is where you can utilize your various contacts in these organizations um to find out information about the can- the world at large it's just a it's such a cool class and it changes what a ranger can do for the overarching um, campaign. Because, like, the biggest thing the rangers do is they help you explore, and they do a lot of things in the in-between times. And this takes that concept of a ranger that, you know, it's not the best fighter, it's not the best social person, it's not the best, yeah, probably the best explorer, right? But it, it accentuates that capacity to make it meaningful in your game and something that you should be proud of and it's something no one else can do. Because that's the problem with Rangers is everyone else can do what they do better. And yeah, just, um and tr- truth be told, that, that was a problem with a lot that's a problem with a lot of the hybrid classes. The Bard had this Bards and Sorcerers mm-hmm. had this problem as well early on. Um yep. however bo- however Bards and Sorcerers as they developed they got they ended up getting a they ended up getting a niche that they were able to fall into. Bards very much are the diplom very much fell into the diplomancer kind of role, whereas um, sorcer- sorcerers um, the thing that saved them was the was the whole bloodline system. Because mm-hmm. um, the yeah. that whole that whole you can cast spells without preparation didn't um, 
didn't have the kind of effect that it was supposed to, and I think that's the reason why. Z I think that's the reason why at least one de at least one dev on the third edition team absolutely despised sorcerers. Um, mm -hmm. Although I can't, I never was able to figure out why. But um, moving past that, it's time for yeah. the stabby boy, Rogue. Rogue, one of my favorites. It is the uh, bartender, bartender rogue. Um, <laughs> It is, it is a master of, um, it is, you can create these various types of drinks um, and potions and different little things. They all have specific little benefits. There is a, um, it's almost like a very, it's a craft heavy rogue situation, but a lot of drinking, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of, um, lot of cool stuff with the bartender rogue. Uh, add, adds a, a layer of support to your rogue that isn't just skill monkey mm -hmm. and allows them to do some, if you, if you want to play a higher intelligent, higher, higher intelligence based rogue, someone with a little bit more cunning than they have dexterity, you mm -hmm. can do something and, and do some preparation stuff. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, sorcerer. Sorcerer is, uh, it's the Oracle, Oracle sorcerer. Mm -hmm. Um, it's associated with frost Wayne. Uh, the sign is the oracle. Um, it is a, it's a divination based sorcerer. It's basically what it is. I don't want to go too much into that one because that's again that's another one that's tied really closely into the lore of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, warlock. 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 Warlock is the frozen warlock. It is a, um, it is the the way that it reads, and you can see this one in the. Um, See por portions of this one in the in the uh, in the document. Uh, it is a powerful entity. Your the frozen is a powerful entity that resides in the most secluded regions of the multiverse, and so it's not necessarily something that's a hundred percent associated with cold. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is something that many people do. They'll say ancient white dragon. They will say um, you know oral. You know from uh, Icewind Dale. Uh, they'll say those sorts of things, but it's it's really anything that resides in the most secluded places uh, of the universe, and it's a it's a warlock that whose patron is dedicated to possibly hiding its existence or making sure no one ever finds it, and it has um, this patron has, I guess, bargained with the warlock to make sure that maybe. All known aspects of its existence are erased. Um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and last, the wizard. The wizard. Um, that's another one that I have out. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have a more con concrete concept on what he's doing with that. Let me go. Let me go grab it. Uh, yeah, Real so, quick. sorry about the Z's. I had I had to get at least one Discworld joke out. Discworld, that world. Um, no, I think it's like no Discworld, as in Terry Pratchett. Discworld. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what? I, I'm I missed some of these. That's on. It's on. That's on me though. It's on All me. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> I think we have a. I think he's he sent me something. There it is. Uh, do, 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 do. Ooh, it is a um occult kind of wizard, like thinking like hedge witches and that sort of thing. There's this con there's this concept in um in because Aurora is a very high magic setting, and there's something that exists in it called Meridium, and this Meridium is an inherently magical ore that is hugely transmutation heavy and like basically it allows you to turn one object into another like you can turn wood into iron and iron into gold but it only lasts for so long but it's a it's a powerful transmutive stone and so the idea of this occult wizard is someone who's used this to acquire magic that they probably shouldn't have and they're able to do things that they ought not be able to outside of the guidelines of Nouveau Maximum and traditional chains, and it's this kind of like hedge outside of all this kind of this occult situation. So. Yeah. Now, 
when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the races, you've got three of them. Um, mm -hmm. What um, what can you what can you tell me about what those three races are going to be adding to are going to be adding to the sandbox? Yeah. So the the one big one is that we created was the and you can see this in the book is the the Fey folk and so the Fey folk are um, the Fey folk is it's a race uh, it is kind of like this marriage between um, mor mortality and the Fey you know so you get this um, this arch Fey type creature um, arch Fey Hagborn and Seder Sun they are kind of just this these the offspring that are the um, of of the of the union of the of the Fey and and humanity and if if you're watching Fates End, which is a Twitch show, um, you'll see Esperis. Esperis is an Arch Fey. Uh, she is uh, part she's part human or part Elvish, part uh, Arch Fey. And um, the I I it's honestly it's something I don't know if it necessarily 100 percent fits <laughs> in this setting. It's just I love the Fey huge fan it's something i wanted to create and something i wanted to do and so you get these uh you get this kind of um it's really three different races because it's you get all these base abilities but then it's also you get the satyr sun the hagborn and the archfey um which are different from everything else that we have um and the other one i want to talk about is um i haven't settled on the perfect name for it yet but it is this uh in the same vein of t Tiefling, in the same vein of Asimar, uh, in the same vein as those kind of like extra planar creatures like the Faithful, um, there's this, there's this, there, there's a race that is more heavily influenced by the signs, right? And and so it's kind of. I don't want to just say Starborn, right? That's it's a working title, but it's it's a race that's heavily influenced by the Zodiac, and it's a race that's built for that. And it um, there's some there's something in the in the world. There's this idea in astrology that everyone's born under specific circumstances. When when you are born, where you were born. The time of day, the place you are, where the celestial bodies were, when you were born, matters. And everyone's are specific, but some of them are special. And these creatures, or these, not creatures, these mortals that are born under a very specific set of circumstances could find themselves more heavily influenced by the signs than others. And they get specific, pretty powerful benefits because of it. All right, I can I can go with I can go with that. The um, you mentioned you I believe you mentioned that there were two that there were. When it comes to the other two races, is that is that something like like what we mentioned with the fighter that that's a little um a little early to reveal at this time? Yeah, the, there's a third race. There's a third race that we're gonna have. I don't I don't want I don't want to talk about it yet. I still have somebody working on that. So, all right. No, I don't I, I don't want to share too much of their. Yeah their concept before they have it settled because we could change a whole bunch of stuff about it yeah i, I got you now mm -hmm. um you don't have to, you don't have to reveal if there, if there's any particulars in this if you if you don't want to but when it comes to things like feats um uh, mag magic items and and the like are those are those going to be planned into the book it's a great question um there will be magic items mm -hmm. there will be spells uh, there will be monsters. Um, we have no plans for feats um, at, at this point, any, anywhere in the book. No, no plans for additional feats and those sorts of things. Um, now, I, I do not think this one, this this book that we're releasing, is going to be uh, super magic item or super monster heavy. Uh, now, we're already on the books for at this point. There's six unique. Uh, divine avatars, which have these massive stat blocks, these huge overarching things. There's another 12 um, monsters that are going to be included in the book as well, uh, like the Arboros and the Dismule and a few other things. Um, but what we're trying to do for this book is we're not trying to overload everyone with monsters and magic items and all those like pluckable little pieces. Um, because what we want to do is we want to make sure that the that the because the the world takes up the majority of this book 
Um, so there's not going to be. Uh, we we didn't do feats. Uh, I I'm not a huge fan of feats personally. I think they're cool, um, but there's only like there's a million feats, but there's really only like three. I um, <laughs> Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I can get that. Personally, I um I'd be a little bit higher on I'd be a little bit higher on feats if it weren't for the fact that it's the, that it's meant to be a replacement for ASI. Yep. Which um. Even even when even when fifth edition came out, I said, "Congratulations! You kind of missed the point on why feats were made." <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and I I know I know some I know some I know some will say will say that I shouldn't be I shouldn't be slagging um the mecha the mechanics for the mechanics for for the game that this is using, but um we be we f we hold these truths to be self evident here in the temple that all men are created <laughs> equal. Um. And I I do not believe in special treatment, positively or negatively. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like everyone's created equal except for very human, which is better than everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I said cremated equal. Oh, cremated equal! Oh my god, it's way yeah. worse. <laughs> yeah. Every, oh man. It doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what you it doesn't matter um what your background is um. If you get if you get shot at with a flamethrower, you get you you're probably going to be stopped, drop, and rolling. <laughs> that it that in a in a in a morbid way that is equality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way, um, in a way, yeah. But with but with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? We want to keep it um, somewhere between two hundred fifty and three hundred. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's where we want to be. Um, we have 67 pages in the sample. Um, I think that, and I, but and I think that represents about a quarter of the book. Um, so I think we're going to struggle to keep it under 300 pages. Um, that's just my that's my initial like opinion. Uh, there's so much art that's going into this thing that we have people on the schedule for and. With 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 so much art and so in such a large scope, I think we're gonna have trouble keeping it under three hundred. Um, but we, we we believe we we believe we can, but it'll be somewhere between two hundred and fifty and three hundred pages. Mm -hmm. um, and the way the way it's kind of structured is you're gonna have the um, you're gonna have the overarching you know introduction to Aurora and how, why it's important and all that kind of stuff. Um, and how it's how it differentiates like what are the gods what are the signs how do the people interact all that kind of stuff um then it jumps straight into character creation like here's here's what you can do that's unique specifically to aurora you get all the character creation information and then uh we go into where how do you fit in the world right so it goes from character creation into factions there are 12 factions uh, rule of twelve across this whole thing. So I think there are twelve factions uh, in the in the book that you can um, plug your characters into if you want to, or just have them be a part of your backstory. You know, if you want to make sure you have some ready made NPCs ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, then there's all the star stuff because now that you know, now that you know what your character is, where they're from, how they fit into the world, it's a good time to figure out what your star sign is. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go through and figure out if you're going to be in a uh, flirtide, if you're going to be a wister, wisterous, whatever you're going to be. Um, and then the rest, after those first five chapters, everything else is basically for the DM. It is magic items, or not magic items, it's cities. There's 12 cities, 13 points of interest. Um, magic, like I said, magic items, monsters, the divine avatars, all that stuff comes after. Basically, it's, it's cut into a player's half and then a DM's half. And there's so much information there. Mm -hmm. And with, now, with all that, with all that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a, as far as a release window, for um star, for Stargazer's Guide? Yeah. So the book the book releases in January, January twenty twenty two. Um. So we 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 had thought that we might get to December, um, for Christmas, but it just. We we've learned from our partners and our because we're partnering up with Gamerarty and uh, a few other places for our printing and stuff like that. That just during that time of the year, 
it all it's very difficult to get everything printed in that in those moments mm-hmm. and and shipped out so the 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 real answer is it's probably going to be january um everyone who's in the kickstarter all of our fabulous backers over there um are all getting the pdf copy they'll probably receive the pdf uh the digital version of the book before that mm-hmm. um because w- once it's ready to go and we're ready for printing ready to do the first run we're gonna go ahead and send that out to everybody so everyone's gonna have the digital version earlier um, and then the remaining pieces of the actual hardback copy of the book, all the Nine Realms products, all that stuff comes out in January 2022. Mm-hmm. And, and then, uh, okay, go ahead. all I was going to say is that, um, so after after it releases in January 2022, um, and everything's been fulfilled, uh, we fully intend to make Stargazer's Guide to, Stargazer's Guide to Arroyo available elsewhere. So we believe you're going to be able to find it uh, on our website, on Drive Through RPG, hopefully you'll be able to find it at some stores. Um, we're working on that now, mm-hmm. and I will I will most certainly be keep be keeping an eye out for it for its de- for its development and al- and also to to um to see to see how to see how long it takes before some before somebody uses a what's your sign gag in a um actual play. Because it's going to happen. <laughs> I assert. You know what? I hope so. We've we actually have, it's so in Fates End, which is our show on Mondays. We have ours, um, and it, we're we're about ready to. I think it's not it's not this Friday. I think it's next Friday. We're bringing in everyone uh, from the Fates End cast, um, and we're gonna have them do their sign live on stream. So everybody, because right now everyone doesn't. Not everyone in, in on the, on the show has a sign at this moment, but we're going to do that character creation for all the characters on stream, and so everybody's going to see that sign. They're going to get those mechanical benefits, and all that's going to come in uh, to play. And then we it's it's crazy. We've actually had I think two different individuals reach out to us, and they're like, "Hey, I'm back to Kickstarter. Uh, we're we're gonna we're we want to run it on Twitch. What do I need to do to?" Um, you know, do credits and things like that. So people are people are already reaching out to us, asking for permission if they want to to stream it on Twitch. And everything in my my little cr- content creator heart is just like bubbling over with happiness when people say that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And like, like, it's, why is it that why is it that I'm always right whenever I'm making dumb jokes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's one. It's one of those. It's one of those mysteries for uh, for the ages that's reserved for the great minds in in this hobby because clearly my mind is not great enough for it. <laughs> but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And yep. anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to um, delve delve more into the setting of Aoria, or to or to bully people for the, for their choice of constellation, um, the door is always open because hey, <laughs> bullying works. Um, maybe so, maybe so. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Miller. I appreciate you having me on. This was a this is a blast. There's there's nothing more, as as many people know. There's nothing more that uh, uh, a DM enjoys more than coming on and talking about their world. Mm-hmm. And so I've just it's it's been a blast and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. And of and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay Fucking frosty, everybody.